All right, welcome back to the weirdest podcast on uh, the interwebs. This is Brad and Kevin with Double B. We're talking to somebody today who is a fucking badass, and I've never sworn <laughs> in the intro, so that's Thank awesome you. Um, so I'm just going to dive right into it. We're not even going to – we're not going into the uh, intro that we, we're trying to do. So uh, today – we're talking to somebody that I've followed for three or four years, uh, kind of rubbed shoulders with him a couple of years ago at, at an event, um, finally gained the courage to add via social media, like what, two months ago, something like that. And dude ended up being like this fucking incredible guy. So <laughs> without any more rambling, this is Jeff Fioro. Yeah, Jeff Thiero, you bet. Yeah, uh, I Thank almost, you. almost got it. Almost, it was almost there. <laughs> Dude, it's fun. So many people have butchered that before. So no, no worries. I've had people call me Tiharel, Tiharel, all kinds of different shit. So I mean, yeah, no worries, man. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, no, thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's always good to get on with some like-minded guys and just start bullshitting. You know, I mean, that's that's what life is all about: having good conversations and connecting with good people. So I appreciate you guys having me on. But yeah, like you said, I just been doing kind of the online coaching thing. You know, I, I used to work uh, do marine construction and stuff like that. And, um, you know, and I love the work and, and, uh, and all that, but I just felt like there was something more that I was supposed to be doing. And even though I enjoyed it and it was good money, you know, there's that, that part of us that, uh, you know, that self actualization part of us, you know, that thing that in our, in our head that tells us, you know, we're not doing what we really were meant to do or built to do. And so, um, that's really where, why I started Jeff it, uh, you know, the shirt that I'm wearing here is something I had made just for myself when I work out, but it's like, um, yeah, I, you know, I knew that uh, I wanted to be involved in fitness. I knew I wanted to be involved with, um, helping people reach their fitness goals and make a transformation. So, um, Jeff, it really started out with my own transformation, you know, kind of going through time of depression. I gained a lot of weight, all this kind of stuff. And then, uh, I made my own transformation, own decision to kind of start uh, investing in my mind, my body, my, you know, my emotional health and uh, started getting back in the gym and made this transformation. And oh, I want to help other people do that too. So I ultimately quit my job uh, doing marine construction and started, uh, started Jeff and now doing online coaching. So it's something I love. It's really uh, basically I um, develop uh, diet, nutrition and training uh, programs for people, specific programs, uh, custom programs based around their specific goals. And then, um, coach them through that as you do like 12 or 90 day, 12 week or 90 day programs, um, based on, on their goals. And then when we get to that point, reassess and, and keep going. And, um, so yeah, I'm really loving what I'm doing and I appreciate you, uh, allowing me to come on and talk about that a little bit. So, yeah, man. Uh, thank you for giving us however long this takes of your time. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> we, we record for like a half hour. Sometimes it's two hours. No, it's all but, good. Uh, there's, there's a couple topics I do want to touch on with you. Um, the first one, I freaking, like, you're hilarious. Because my, my favorite, all-time favorite uh, picture that you've ever posted was the one of you holding the brawny paper towels wearing the lovely oh, yeah. picture. <laughs> yeah, I know. Shirt. <laughs> but, like, and I, I kind of know a bit about your, your background and stuff and how powerlifting kind of got into uh, a big part of your life and yeah. you're like I have a picture of me I'm six foot one 220 standing next to Dave Daly and we're both flexing and I oh, yeah. a fucking pencil I love Dave he's 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 a savage big dude I love him but on the flip side dude like you scare the fuck out of me because you're <laughs> like, oh, man, I, you I make mean, Dave I'm, look I'm, fucking I'm, tiny I'm the, the gentle giant man well you got me by a couple inches I'm not that tall so you, you're more the giant than I am but uh no I uh you know I and that's the thing I mean some people you know judge a book by their cover and they you know they uh they see me or see people that uh you know kind of have that that meathead look and they just assume that just by looking at you that you're of less than average intelligence but uh sometimes I start having a conversation with people and it's, it's nice because sometimes they'll pause and kind of look at me and go, you know, you're actually smarter than I thought you would be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I guess that's a compliment, but it kind of goes to show you that sometimes I get that meathead stigma, right? You know, you're not as dumb as you look. <laughs> right. No, but <laughs> yeah. you know, you're talking about being funny. I mean, when I, when I, part of, part of value to me is like, if I'm not, if I'm not laughing or learning, 
uh, then it, then it's not value, you know? And so part right. of adding value to me is like, yeah, there's the part where, you know, I'm teaching people what they need to know um, to get from. Oh, you went on mute. Oh, muted. There we go. Um, did I lose you there? You got me? Yeah. You, no, we got you now. You're back. Okay. Um, kind of lost my train of thought there. Someone was calling me. I should shut that off. Uh, yeah, so what was I talking about? <laughs> uh, you were talking about value. If you weren't laughing, you weren't learning. No, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so value, like to me, like, again, if I'm not, if I'm not laughing or learning, then it's not, it's not valuable to me because our time is our most precious commodity. And there's so much crap on the internet. There's so much garbage out there. There's so much negativity. Um, and there's so much just pointless uh, air out there that it's like, you know, I want, I, I feel like I'm a realist, but I'm also an optimist, you know, I'm, I, I, but I like to add value. And then for me, that means like making people laugh, making myself laugh and not just, you know, throwing out like cookie cutter diet, nutrition and training programs, like a, like a robot with no emotion, but you know, you're, you're involved with people's lives on a, on a personal level. And for a lot of people, like laughter is medicine. It is for me, certainly. So like, that's a huge part of the value that I try to add is, is, is humor you know, and, and laughter. I like to make myself, half of what I do is just to make myself laugh. But then I, I share it with other people because, you know, I, I hope that, you know, in my goal to make myself laugh, and that I can also make other people laugh too, right? Yeah, I was going to bring that up is people say laughter is the best medicine. And I completely oh, so agree. True. So, so true. Uh, I wanted to, to kind of bring you and Brad together a little bit. Uh, both of you are competitive power lifters. Yeah. yeah. You've won state twice, uh, Brad and his, his brother and his father, uh, and my sister and, and his and sister. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, uh, <laughs> you guys got that shit like unlock. I am just, I, I like potato chips. <laughs> the best power lifters in the world love potato chips man that, that's a good thing yeah. about being a power lifter when i was doing that right now i'm kind of more focused on aesthetics or kind of leaning up a little bit but when you're a power lifter man that as long as you're not trying to stay in any specific weight class it's pretty you know eat what you want i mean it's not like bodybuilding where they're eating real clean and stuff i mean they're still getting in the protein and the calories but you know they're it's a different ball game power lifting. I mean, you see some dudes are three four five hundred pounds i mean that's how much they weigh and man they're they're big muscular dudes but they they also uh you know, they don't hold back on the eating in any way so yeah you might be a really good power lifter i know you got a barbecue shirt on barbecue is the best muscle builder out there man so barbecue yeah. beer freedom that's it you know what that, that was my diet for a while in college for when i was it was it was chicken breast pizza beer barbecue and you know i didn't really give a shit how i looked i just want to be strong as hell and, and that's the way i did it so something that works right well i mean that's that's one thing that people don't understand too about uh um power lifting to any other sport and lifting is power lifting yeah they look fat yeah but they're stronger than an ox yeah. or you have somebody else who just looks aesthetically pleasing who may not have much power behind them sure and to kind of reiterate on what you said you know if you're not trying to stay in a certain weight then yeah, eat what you want. But if you're trying to stay in a certain weight group, it can be difficult. Oh, for sure. For, for sure. four no, bodies, years, I tried to that? stay in the 242. Oh, I 242, mean, yeah. It was difficult. And Dude, my brother's like, well, why do you do that? I'm like, because I don't like being heavier than 242. Oh, for sure. That's a that's a competitive weight class, too. There's some strong motherfuckers in that weight class. 242, I mean, I've seen guys do... I mean, now, now it's crazy. I mean, I just saw Hofthor Bjornsson and a couple guys. I mean, they're deadlifting over a thousand pounds. Yeah. Now and, and I, bench I think pressing. the last one he was like 1150 raw. It's insane. It's insane. Yeah. Well, those kind of numbers. I mean, I mean, that's just out of this world. And I, you know, one of the top Russian, I'm more into uh, you know, I used to do assisted lifting, but I kind of like the raw thing because to me, it's like, I want to win or no, like what am I, humanly possible capable of i mean i've seen people where other people won meets because they had better equipment you know some of those squat suits can add two three hundred pounds if you got oh, yeah. like a triple ply canvas suit on that's you know tighter than hell i mean 
guys are getting two, 300 pounds out of it. And it's like, I hate to think that I want to meet because I had better equipment than some other guy. And so when I see someone do a, a raw bench press with no wraps, no shirt, there's a guy uh, from Russia right now, a uh, krill something or other. Uh, he did a, like, I think it's 740 pound raw bench press with no, you know, no wraps. I mean, nothing. I said, I mean, that's incredible. That's impressive. So, you know, that's a great squat for most people. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's insane. I mean, so, I mean it's really I, competitive out there now. I, I could, I could go with that. Uh, um, when I competed before I, I hurt almost everything in my body, um, uh, we, we competed in the WABDL, which limits you yep. to single and double ply. Yep. And uh, I gave my brother my squat suit and a shirt. And he doesn't like the shirt because it, it bit him. It, I mean, every time I put it on, you'd ha- everywhere the seam was, you'd have sores. Yeah. Um, but uh, he loves the de- the, my squat suit because I use it as a, as a deadlift suit because it allows my hips to kind of enact faster. In the Wabdo, that's just bench press and deadlift, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they, uh, you can, there's like three squat suits that you could use that's qualifiable. Yeah. Um, and my brother's like, well, I'm going to use it. And it gave him like an extra 100 pounds. He goes, yeah, I lifted that much. I go, no, my suit helped you lift you that much. Well, a good, a super good way, suit. <laughs> a good way to tell, like you said, I, I, was, I was looking, I used to subscribe to Powerlifting Magazine, and I, I used to just kind of totally nerd out on the numbers and stuff and kind of see who's out there and uh you know they post all the different meets from around the country and as you get closer to you know state and nationals and stuff you can kind of get an idea who's going to go and who's going to be there and what kind of numbers are going to do but you know i saw a couple meets in these obscure federations where there'd be like a a 300 pound bench press and like a 500 pound deadlift and then there's like an 850 squat and i'm like yeah huh and, you know, that just goes to show you that it's that it's all equipment. I mean, because it doesn't assist you that much in the deadlift. I mean, a little bit, but, uh, you know, if they're doing the – and then you put a squat suit on and they're probably not going to any kind of, real, you know, decent depth. And so they're doing this – and they're counting these numbers that would never get passed in any other, you know, like any other federation. I used to – I lifted in the USAPL, which is um, – Okay, yeah. Probably – I mean, there's a couple out there that are real good. That's, like, probably on the higher end of, like – strictness as far as like depths and everything i mean so they're the, probably the most stricted drug tested and, and most professional about the rules i think is probably and that's why i chose them is because i felt uh, felt like it was the most whatever i did was the most legitimate you know in that sense yeah but the numbers aren't as big in, in that federation be, because they're drug tested and because they're equi- they're real stringent about equipment and depths and things so a lot of people look at other federations because the numbers are bigger but they're simply not as the reps and things aren't that much quality plus the drug use is just out of, out, out of the world and some of the other federations you know yeah i uh, i could agree with that that's one thing that i loved about the uh, that wabdl is it, it was the same way as the usapl it was yeah. you know sh- very strict on the gear very strict on drugs there was a one strike rule on drugs and uh um one lady i think it was this last worlds or last worlds um the, the year before i had like a lady that was like 125 pounds deadlifted 300 pounds oh wow and it's yeah, like oh okay that's that's awesome i mean and then i heard that it was raw i'm like wait a minute yeah that's <laughs> hold on and well, you know i i have no you know we talk about the drug use thing like i have no problem with people who are in federations where it's like it's assumed like if you go if you do like an ifbb pro bodybuilding contest i mean it's just assumed everyone's on drugs and everyone knows it so the playing field is level and in that sense i'm okay i mean it's like okay you know if you if you want to take those risks with your body and do those things like that's fine you know you know the only problem that i have is where it's you know specifically cheating where it says you can't do it so the undrug tested ones they part of what makes them uh, so popular is is the numbers and so they they actually want people to be doing these things that they want to do to get as strong as they can and so when that's the assumption or that's kind of how those things are built then you know people should be able to in my mind um do what they want to do but you know it's the cheating part of it trying to get in go to a drug testing thing or whatever that i have a problem with you know yeah i i could agree with that i mean if you 
that's that's one thing that I like is you know show up in the best you, and that's all that matters. Yeah. No. Exactly. Exactly. And one thing that always drove me nuts—I don't know if it still if it drives you nuts—is people always thought that a powerlifting competition was always just a bunch of meatheads. <laughs> and well, and so it's, many, it's a huge community. Oh, to- totally. And there are so many people. There, are, I mean, do um, you know Stan Efforting? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you know he's a guy. If you just looked at him on the surface, I mean, the guy he's called the rhino for a reason. He looks like a rhinoceros. The dude is huge. He's got a bald head. And if you just looked at him, you'd think this guy has no sense about him. I mean, he's just a raging bull and there's n- probably nothing going on. upstairs. He just looks like one of those dudes. Yeah. But he's, he's one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. He does podcasts. He's incredibly smart with diet, nutrition, and training. Uh, you know, he, you know, he freely admits himself that, you know, to drug usage and things, but he talks about it. So people who want to do it, he educates them on it, but super smart guy. I mean, doctorate level stuff, but he, you know, it's kind of one of those things. Don't judge a book by its cover. I mean, some people, there are those freaks in nature out there. Of course there's the true meatheads, but you have to be somewhat intelligent to get to that high of a level. You have to be smart about your diet, nutrition, and training. And, you know, there's, it takes some level of intelligence to get to that that high of a level um, for sure, especially these days where it's not just about meat and potatoes anymore. People are really getting into the science and maximizing the science of diet, nutrition and training to a degree they never used to. And so you can't be a total idiot and and be, be the best anymore, you know, for sure. Right. Yeah. I think that was one thing that uh, after I got hurt, um, everybody's like, well, why don't, why don't you still compete? I'm like, I am so far out of the game now. I'm at, I'm at like 260 pounds now. And oh, like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, I'd have to cut 20 pounds. And then when I build back up to myself, there's no way I could stay in that. In that well, category. the good thing, the good thing about, you know, wherever you're at too, is, and I'm sure you heard this is <clears throat> we have what's called muscle memory. And so you can always get back to a place you've been before muscle size wise or muscle strength wise. Uh, you can always get back to that place quicker than if you've never built, been there before. So it's like a bodybuilder, you know, now there's a few pro bodybuilders like back in the nineties who were real, you know, real strong, you know, huge dudes. Like I'm trying to think of a good example, like, um, CT you know, Fletcher, well, Ronnie C. T. Coleman. Fletcher, but, um, I'm thinking like Flex Wheeler and there was another guy. So okay, Flex yeah. Wheeler, um, you probably remember he took time off. So he, he got, he shrunk down to a normal size, like any, you know, anyone, any one of us basically, he, he's, he's still in good shape, but he, you know, he's normal size. Right. Well, he decided he wanted to get back into it a couple of years ago. So he's like 50 years old. So he started, you know, taking all the same steroid stacks he did, but he started lifting again. Um, and he blew right back up to almost where he was within a number, just a, a number of months because of the muscle memory. Like you've been to that place before your body grows back. And so the muscle that would have taken someone who is starting years and years and years and years to get to that point, he was able to put that back on in just a few months. And, you know, like you, if you ever, you know, got serious about, you know, whatever, again, that strength would come back a lot quicker than if you'd never built it before. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing that I've thought about, but my wife always laughs because I mean, I, I tore a bicep and then I, I damaged four uh, vertebrae in my back. Oh, wow. And, I, I have to be careful. I did this stupid maneuver last night at the gym. Have you seen that video that's going around Facebook of that, uh, that guy, he, he does this bench press with 225 and then he, he benches it up and then he does a sit up with it and then comes back down. Yep. Yeah. I so saw I, that. I, I tried that at the gym the other day and I, I was, I'll have to send you the video. Like I was able to do it, but it, uh, that, uh, was not pleasant so I'm paying for it this morning. I was able to do oh, one bet. barely, but uh, yeah, that was the, the fulcrum point on that in my back was right in the you know lower back, and so mm-hmm. I was sitting up with it and pushing at the same time, and that was dumb. But I'm yep. kind of one of those. In that sense, I'm a meathead sometimes. Where <laughs> when it's a strength thing, I get that in my mind like, "Fuck it, I'm going to try it, whatever." And that's that's sometimes where I'm dumb and I know better. And there's been times where I've taken time off before from weightlifting, and sometimes I got to be careful when I get back into it because in my mind, you know, I knew what I used to be able to do. And so there's part of me that's like, well, I at least got to be able to do 400 pounds a day, or I at least got to be able to do this today. My, I'm maybe capable of 
doing it, but it's, I should be working myself back into that, you know, it's just, I'm sometimes an idiot. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm in that position right now of working myself back into it. Um, I'm with a great chiropractor now and uh, he's fixed a lot of my back issues. And I think three weeks ago I was with my wife and we were working out and she was, why aren't you doing full squats? I go, my back won't take it. Oh, you're a pussy. No, my back won't take it. I have to work those muscles back in. And she goes, well, even with a bar, I go, even with just my weight. <laughs> Dude, yeah, no, for sure. For not, sure. Only, not only that, uh, his wife is an Olympic lifter. So she does the quick snaps and stuff. So oh, yeah. Head and yeah. Gym. <laughs> I used to, I used to be, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I used to so I used to I used to do Olympic weightlifting, right? And I, I, that's how I actually kind of started out um, before powerlifting. Um, was doing a little bit of Olympic lifting. I was not as good at that uh, by any stretch of the means, uh, but I, I of what being good is. But I um, yeah, I, I tried that. I was pretty good at the clean and jerk, but like the snatch, I just had no because my 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 chest like from doing powerlifting like. I was so forward and so tight like that, that, that snatch yeah. position. I just couldn't get in. I mean, I could, I could do it in training. And then when I get to a meet, because I was more of a grip it and rip it guy with the snatch as opposed to finesse, I ended up power snatching. Um, I think the most I'd done like power snatches, like 120 kilos or something like that. And then my clean, I think I, I'd done uh, 170 kilos or something, but I mean, that's, from what you know guys you know there's guys doing you know over 200 kilo well over 200 kilos and, and all kinds of crazy stuff i mean getting close to the 600 pound you know like clean and jerk clean and jerking 600 pounds like that's that's they're getting close to those numbers i mean that's that's insane that's a good deadlift for a lot of people you know yeah. just to be able to roll that across the gym floor is a, is a feat of strength but to pick it up and throw it over your head i mean that's that's the kind of strength that i have awe of because you know i've I've done like a, you know, my, my best, like a 500 pound raw bench press and a few other things. And, and those are good numbers. But w when you look at really what's really out there, like, I mean, there's it's like the kind of, the idea of picking up 600 pounds, like that would be a good deadlift or, you know, for a lot of people, but the idea of just picking it up quickly and throwing it over your head. I mean, that's, that's a whole different level of strength that, I mean, even if I took all kinds of steroids and did all kinds of stuff, my, that takes a level of, uh, genetics that I simply don't have to, to, to be able to do something like that. I mean, the guys who are doing this are, you know, I've seen some Russian dudes, uh, uh, you know, up close and personal at some of these meets and like, you know, his wrists are this big around, you know, and he's got these, these joint, these, these knee joints that like, they look like they su could support that kind of weight. And like, you know, that's, it doesn't matter how many drugs you take. I mean, that's, that's genetics right there. I and mean, there's only so much that, people can do to get to that level. I mean, at some point there's some people who are just genetic freaks. So they're genetic freaks. Plus they're doing their giant new training perfectly. Plus they're training, you know, they're, they're beasts in the gym. Plus they're taking all kinds of drugs. So all the combination, I mean, you just get every once in a while you get these super freaks that, you know, people can't even touch. I mean, some of there's a few, there's a few weightlifting records out there that haven't been beaten since the seventies. And those are the kinds of things where, even though the drugs and the diet, nutrition, and training have gotten, you know, so much better since then, uh, the reason those records still stand is be simply because that person was just a freak, and no one's come close to that yet. So, I mean, all those things will eventually be broken, but some of the ones that have stood for a while, um, you know, there's this guy Paul Anderson who was real popular back in the '50s, and he he was probably clean because he was doing his thing before kind of the advent of you know, real steroids and testosterone and things like that. So he was doing numbers that, you know, guys now who are on all kinds of drugs were doing. I mean, he, but you look at the way he built, in fact, after you get up this podcast, you should look up Paul Anderson, strongman, and just look at the way he's built. Like there's pictures of him in the forties and his, you know, his legs were like 38 inches around. I mean, he's just, and he, I mean, he looked like a, this, he just looked like a, he's just a super freak. And um, he would do these things where he'd squat, you know, squat a thousand pounds and he put like he did this like lift where he gets underneath this thing and he lifts up his back and he like four thousand pounds or something some insane number that people just could never do uh you know it just hasn't been touched so 
every once in a while you get like those literally human Samsons and things like that, but it's, it's mostly some kind of genetic freak thing. And actually when that guy passed away, they had, he said that he wanted to kind of donate his body to science. And they, when they were doing a dissection of his quad muscle, um, he had some unique anatomy going on there. Like, I don't know if it was extra muscle, but it was, it helped with his strength in a, in a very unique way. So he had some muscle structure, extra muscle in his leg that was just not normal. So there's freaks out there. It's just, they're, they're few and far between. Yeah. I, I, I've looked into him and he's, yeah, I watch, I watch a lot of strong men and go, that's awesome. I don't yeah. want to do that. <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of weight. Yeah. I, I, you know that, and that's uh, the strongman thing is a whole different thing. I, I had done, uh, I don't know if you saw that video I posted a while back there. I did a strongman thing. Um, my first one was back in like 2000, 2000 I was like 18 or so. And um, I hadn't trained for it at all. So I, I did, uh, I was, you know, doing powerlifting and stuff like that. So, and a little bit of Olympic lifting. So that translated really well into the strongman stuff, especially the clean and jerk, because we did the log press and I was able to jerk it. And so I had, I had really good form in the, in the clean and jerk. And so that, when I went to do the log press, that just naturally translated really well. And then um, because of the deadlift and powerlifting strength that I had, like the farmer's carry where you pick up those real heavy units and I'm running with it. Um, even though I hadn't trained for it, those, those types of strength things translated really well. So I did really well in it, but I will say that because I had been training as powerlifting, you know, we take, when you do powerlifting, you'll do a minimal amount of reps. So it's maximum strength with low, you know, high, high weight and low reps. And so it's taxing on your central nervous system, your CNC, but it's not really taxing on your cardio. So like I was doing these one rep max, you know, these one rep lifts and two rep, rep, two, three rep lifts, but I was taking five minutes of rest between sets. And so letting my, you know, my cardio system fully re replenish. So, you know, I really had no cardio, uh, you know, real, any substantial like cardio. So like when I did this strongman thing and I just walked into it, the first couple of events I did really well, but then my body's like, what in the hell are you doing? You're, you're, you're just going from one thing to the other. And so it's like, I, I learned right there and there that it takes, you know, it's not just about strength. I mean, those guys who are 350 pounds, 400 pounds who are doing that kind of stuff. I mean, that is a true feat of strength because they're, they're doing these things that not only require strength, but uh, an incredible amount of endurance and cardio when you talk about some of these guys who have hearts the size of you and I, but they are, you know, six, five, six, 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 seven, and 400 pounds. And they have all that muscle, you know, that muscle burns up so much oxygen and so much nutrients. I mean, and that to, to be able to do that, uh, a lot of these guys are pushing themselves beyond what they should be for, you know, in fact, uh, Jesse Marundi, if you look him up, uh, I don't know how much in, in the strongman you are, but like uh, he, couple years back he's a good friend of mine he trains um uh he used to train out here uh close to me but he took second place in the metrics world strongest man uh next to marius pujanowski and marius pujanowski as you guys know if you're into it like he he was the reigning champion for a number of years so the fact that my buddy was able to get to and that's the elite of, you know there's all kinds of strong mans but the metrics the one you see on tv like that's like the the ultimate like to get to that and to win that like that's so he took second in that but my buddy jesse was also six seven i mean he was a tall dude he was you know 320 something pounds and and um he was training one day just doing squats and he, he passed out and then he unfortunately passed away but he had a genetic he had a hole in his heart a genetic thing that they had gone um you know, unnoticed through all those things, but, you know, he was doing so much work and so much thing was just overtaxing on his heart for the size that he was in this pre pre-existing condition that he had. So unfortunately you do see a lot of these strongman guys who, you know, pass away every once in a while. Cause they're, you know, they're 400 pound dudes and you see these dudes doing deadlifts with thousands of pounds and their noses are bleeding, you know, they're blowing out arteries and things like that. And, you know, the, the drugs that they're taking certainly doesn't help that either with the higher blood pressure and things. So, I mean, some of these guys, especially with the strongman stuff, they're, you know, they're definitely taking a risk with their health. And a lot of these guys pay for it. You know, it's a risk because you're, you're going to pay for it probably later in life with, with joint issues or whatever. But, uh, you know, the, the reward is pretty cool, I suppose, when you can stand and say I'm the strongest man in the world, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, a couple of years back, I got to meet uh, Brian Shaw. 
Oh, huge. He's huge, man. Yeah. Like, I'm 6'4". Like and at the time, I was like 265. And yeah. I went, hi. Holy shit. You're really tall. And I'm like, how big is your hand? He goes, you want to see something cool? I go, yeah. And he grabbed my face. Like, he Dude. grabbed all of my face. Dude, that's scary. I'm like, what I mean, the that's scary. <laughs> and the thing is, like, something like that, like, what do you, you – I mean – I'm a pretty good fighter and I can do, you know, but what you, you what do you do to somebody? You can't, yeah. You, what are you going to do? You can't do I mean, nothing to some guy that side, me right? a gun, maybe. <laughs> I mean, did you see that sparring thing? It was, uh, it was a few months back where, um, oh, it was, uh, Hofthor Bjornsson, you know, that. Oh yeah. Yeah. From Game of Thrones. And he was sparring with, uh, oh, who's the, Almost my brain's not working. Who just fought a few weeks ago? An Irish dude, um, MMA fighter. Uh, Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor. They were sparring and they were doing this thing. I mean, sort of joking, but they were kind of getting into it. And then they started talking and someone brought up like who would actually win in a fight. And they both just admitted like, oh, dude, he, if he would crush me, like there's no, I mean, yeah, I'm like the f best fighter in my weight class, but it's like if he got a hold of me, like there's nothing I could do. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, so I mean, it's just at some point, the size, it just, uh, you know, size does matter, right? Yeah, it's just a stay away game at that point. Hope that he gets tired. No, but like, but like you were talking about, like, not to get too far off track, but they, you know, like some of those guys, man, they, uh, I, I remember I was at a cafe in Florida and uh, this little, like, sports car pulled up it was a really nice like amg like one of those two hundred thousand dollar mercedes benz blacked out and then i see the car kind of moving around it was blacked out i couldn't see and i see the door kind of open and i see this huge arm like come up on top of the roof and like grab the roof and i'm like what and i see this person like struggling to like get out of the car and he's like got his leg like like trying to get out and all of a sudden like this dude who looked like just it was a big sh like the D big show for wwe okay yeah and like he's going to this cafe and he just i'm like how did he get out of that i mean i'd seen him obviously on tv but when you you know he come up and walk into the cafe and i you know he was pretty cool so i kind of i'm like dude i'm a huge fan i just gotta shake your hand because i've always wanted to see him. dude it's like he just like in like like his whole yeah like, he said he, if you could just take his hand and just wrap it around my whole head it's like it was a whole different you know He's five, you know, at his biggest, I think he was over 500 pounds. And just, yeah, you know, over tall he is, but you know, like seven three or something. That's crazy. But the fact that Hofthor Bjornsson, he's he's getting close to seven feet, I think himself, or I don't, oh, I don't know, he's up in those numbers. But to to be that tall and to deadlift at that, you know, 1100 pounds, I mean, he's got a, he's got, I mean, he's got long arms, but he's got quite a distance to pull that weight up, you know. And that's one of the reasons I was a fairly good bench presser is that. You know, I don't have short arms, like midget arms or anything, but I have shorter arms than, like, a lot of people do. And, uh, you know, that certainly helps, you know, part of its body mechanics, too. There's some people who just aren't built to be a good bench presser or whatever. And then then there's people who have shorter legs and longer arms. And, you know, there's guys who are two, 220. Um, there's guys who are 200 pounds who are, who are deadlifting in the eight low 900s. And that's insane. I mean, you get it. Mean, guy those guys are monsters. Yeah, and but they can't they can't bench press. So you, I've seen guys who right. have like a nine yeah. hundred pound deadlift and then they bench like three forty, and it's like okay, well you can see that that's a body. He's just a freak of nature, and that person that you know that how his body mechanics work, you know. Well, and I I can agree with that too because I mean I could I could do a six hundred pound squat, yeah, so maybe you know, a three hundred pound deadlift, and like maybe a two sixty five bench. Those are good numbers like, well, for intense purposes. Yeah, and people are like, well, how can we do that? I'm like, I'm just better at the squat. Just no, oh, for sure. Well, um, and then there's a guy. If you look up another good guy, if you want to see something impressive, uh, Ray Williams, uh, black dude. He's probably six three, um, but his, you know, his bench press and his deadlift are okay. They're they're kind of, you know, I think he benches. I don't know if he's done five, but he's in the four or something. But at his size, that's that's nothing special. And then his deadlift is is pretty good. But he's got this insane squat. So he does USAPL raw is all he does. So he does all these raw things. But he squats. He's one of the only guys who can squat over 1,000 pounds raw. So I think he's done like 1,100 pounds raw squat. And when I say raw squat, he's like burying it. Like, But when you look at the way this dude's built, he's a big dude upper body. But his 
his legs, they look like, I mean, he, he, that's another guy who's like a Paul Anderson in the lower body. It's just this freak of nature. So yeah, get, check out Ray Williams squatting. Like it is, it is something to behold. I mean, I've never, I'm impressed with on, like raw lifting that's over a thousand pounds is in anything is, is amazing to me because sometimes I've seen these squats where you say, like, Oh, this guy's done 1200 pound squat. And then you look at it and it's like, it's more like a leg press. Cause you're not even walking out with it. You know, you lift it and they got the mono lift, which, you know, pulls the racks away. So all you're doing is basically getting in the perfect power position. You're lifting it up and then you have like knee wraps, like these real tight knee wraps. You've got this canvas squat suit that you almost have to like pull yourself down to make it compress. And so you're basically this, not only are these guys strong to begin with, but they've got this like spring loaded system. And then it's like, okay, I mean, at some degree, it's like, how much can that guy actually do raw? I mean, there's guys who are claiming over a thousand pound squats, but they're probably, you know, raw squatting, maybe, maybe 650 or 700 pounds, you know, so then, and that's just stupid. That's just how good their equipment is and how, how poor the judging is and the depth squats there, you know. Well, that's, that's one reason why uh, uh, I liked Ed Cohen. Uh, yeah, dude. I mean, that guy, I mean, oh, uh, every everybody's like, well, who's Ed Cohen? I just just look it up. He, I mean, raw everything. I met him in Chicago. Uh, that's I think he still lives there, but that's that's where I went to nationals. I won nationals in Chicago in two thousand one uh, in USAPL, and that's where his uh, quads gym, I think it is, in Chicago. Um, and in two thousand, he I mean he he still does some stuff, but in two thousand, he was still actively training and stuff like that and I think he's in his 50s now um, but in his 40s he was still incredible I mean doing over a thousand pound squats and things like that but um, yeah for that guy's size I think at one point you know in the 242 or low 242s you know he was deadlifting nine in the 900s back in the day where nobody was coming close to those numbers now you got guys a lot of guys doing over 900 nowadays but he was you know he was he was doing numbers that people just didn't understand. And, um, you know, he always, he always looked well built, but he was one of those guys who was a lot stronger than he looked. I mean, he, he looked at him, he's like, yeah, he's a good, well-sized dude, but you know, to be benching, like his bench press was pretty good. I think he's done close to six or something like that, but you know, his, his squat and his deadlift, I mean, were just out of this world, but you look at him, you're like, Holy crap, that guy, I mean, he looks like he should be able to do some big numbers, but not like a thousand pound squat or a 900 pound deadlift. So sometimes you get these people who surprise you, you know, and that's, that's why, you know, you should never judge a book by its cover. Cause sometimes you, you get people who, you know, they look like they're in good shape, but they're incredibly strong. Like right now, cause I've been losing weight, like my size might be deceptive, but I still, you know, I was doing some reps on the bench the other night with 400 pounds and I, I'm built leaner now than I used to be, but you know, there's guys at the gym who, you know, they're a lot bigger than me. They have, you know, 20 inch arms or something, but they, they look like they should be able to do a 500 pound bench press, but they, you know, they can barely do 315. So it's just a different type of training, you know? And that's where, that's where when I talk about Jeff and setting people up a, a program is like, there's a science to this whole thing. And, and when you can understand the science of it, that's when you make, you maximize your results. And so when I really got into this, you know, I'm like, how do I, how do becoming the best, which you want to become the best at something. I'm like, okay, I want to win nationals. Well, how do I do that? Well, part of it for me meant maximizing every aspect of my diet, nutrition, and training. Um, so, you know, take my personal genetics as far as I could, but maximize that through these other things. And that took learning the science of it. And so many people, they don't understand the science of it. You know, they get a gym membership and I, I call the I call it doing what you feel. They go into the gym and they do what they feel. You know, they might, you know, the first of the year get a gym membership and they'll go in and be like, okay, I'm going to start, start working out. And like, okay, I'm going to do some bench presses and they'll go over there and they'll do kind of a few reps and they'll rest and maybe do a few more and they'll be like, I'm going to do some curls. And you know, that's the mentality. You know, they just think I'm lifting weights. I'm going to get bigger. Well, you know, as you well know, like there's a, there's a, there's a system to this whole thing. And if you want to maximize your results, Um, it means having a progress, some, developing some kind of progressive overload system where you're doing things methodically. And that's why I always tell people that it's good to keep a journal. I don't like doing it, but if you want to maximize your results, it's like, okay, 
we do the same exercises for a certain amount of weeks. And then we, we find our starting point. We find like, okay, what's your max? We figure that out. And then we do like a percentage, like, okay, like you lift the most amount of weight you can for each, for the, for the reps. And then, you know, so then you write that down in your journal. And then the next week when you do the same workout, it's as simple as looking back and say, okay, this week I did a 300 bench, 300 pound bench press for 10 reps today. I'm going to do, five pounds more or try to do five pounds more. So if you have that mentality of always, you know, raising the bar, so to speak, literally and figuratively, like that's how you make the results is, is adopting some kind of progressive overload system where there's, there's, you're intentionally um, keeping track and intentionally always adding weight because, you know, our bodies only grow as strong as they need to be to handle the weight or the, you know, the, the um, tension that they're, we're subjecting them to. And so, um, in order to continue to get bigger and, and stronger, we need to continue to subject our body to greater and greater demands. And that's what most people don't get. You see guys who go into the gym and they do year after year, they're gym rats, but they go in there and they do the exact same thing. You'll see them throw like 135 pounds on the bench. They'll do a few reps and they'll maybe go up to 225. So they're fairly strong, but they're doing the same thing over and over. So, you know, they get to a point where their body you know, is strong enough to do 225, but they look the same. They don't change any more than that. And they just year after year, keep doing the same thing. And <clears throat> they're essentially just wasting their time and maintaining the little strength they were able to build. But, um, you know, there is definitely a science to that. And that's where um, really good coaching comes in. If people really want to make a true transformation or, or um, maximize their results is to get with someone who can help you maximize those other areas of your or you know and understands the science of it yeah it's i mean people that are listening it's 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 a science um and when you go to the gym it's almost religion like because you you've got to be pretty strict on it oh for sure and uh um my wife asked me one day to kind of go through a weekly thing for her and i went through a weekly thing for her and she goes well that's stupid and i'm like no that's what you got to do. Oh, for sure. And, um, like she, my wife does uh, um, uh, nutritional stuff and fitness stuff and track and field coaching now. Oh yeah. And uh, she was, she was like, I can't get this one person to do this. And I'm like, well, did you tell them to do this? And I'm like, oh shit. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm like, there it is. It's always the little thing you miss. Um it's and this consistency, consistency is really the key. And that's what's missing for most people is it's like, you know, I tell people like the disconnect for most people isn't the lack of information. I mean, any one of us, you know, I, I know you listened to that podcast the other day, but uh, part of it is like any one of us right now could go on Google and, and download a 12 week fitness program. The information's there. It's easy to access. And if you have the discipline to follow that program, like, you'll get the results, but you know, the disconnect again for a lot of people is, you know, it's not the lack of information. It's, it's the motivation. It's the, it's the discipline. And so the question really is like, how do you, how do you create that discipline to, you know, again, do the things that you need to do to get from where you are to where you want to be. And that's, that's really the, that's really what it comes down to is developing the discipline and discipline means doing discipline is basically synonymous with consistency. The things you do consistently are, is discipline and it's the things you do consistently on a daily basis that, that lead up to something that add to something big. And so, you know, for me, um, when I start getting real consistent with it and I, I'm, you know, I'm eating properly um, on a, you know, at least five days a week or six days a week and I'm training four days a week and I'm doing that and I'm, on top of like my uh, taking like my you know, vitamins and protein at specific times, I'm doing all this stuff and I'm doing it consistently. Like the results come so much quicker, so much quicker when you have all that other stuff dialed in and you're consistent with it. You know, cause before I learned any of this, like I was just lifting weights and eating big meals three times a day. And I, yeah, I made progress, but when I, first of all, learn the science behind training. I was, and I was working my ass off. So I was putting the same amount of effort into it, but if you, you can take the same amount of effort, um, and if you do it in the confines of like a, a, a diet nutrition training program, that's based off of scientific principles, like that same effort will go 
twice as far. And so that's why if people really want to maximize the results um, in anything they do, that's, that has to do with their body, like understanding the science behind how the body works and, and how um, diet, nutrition, and training like affect that is, is, is key. And, and that's one thing like, and I kind of am a nerd about that. So like, I enjoy this. Like when I read this stuff or I help people and, and part of it, like even having this conversation, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's fun for me because I'm, I'm, it's like someone who likes, you know, Star Wars or something else. He go off on all these things about all that. And, you know, other people are just like, what the hell are you talking about? So, you know, sometimes I start talking about, you know, the other day I was talking about the, this training style, it's staggering rep ranges and things to produce maximum results. And it's called undulating periodization. So here I am talking about undulating periodization and uh, progressive overload systems and, you know, and I'm just going off about it. And this other person was fitness oriented too, but obviously not as, you know, as nerding out as I am. So at some point they're like, dude, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, man. Like, it sounds cool, but I just, we're going to have to, talk, you know, I don't know. I have nothing to add to this conversation. And then I just realized like, holy shit, I'm, I'm a nerd. I just shut my pie hole. <laughs> yeah. Yep. We had oh, an yeah. episode like that. Um, and it, it is undulating when the wife's on her periodization. But <laughs> dude that i gotta steal that that's <laughs> but yeah we did an right? episode with my buddy jordan um who that's runs cool. this that's company cool. that does uh guitar uh pedals and stuff and yeah, yeah. Went fucking ape shit about ohms and amps and it was like 30 minutes it was i great. don't know what he but it all went <laughs> i have over. no clue what he said <laughs> But he was so passionate, and that's what I appreciated. So, like, I just sat here literally for an hour watching you two just go back and forth and back and forth. Dude, that story reminds me. So, like, I joke I joke about it, but, I mean, and I, I, I mean, in real life, I have no problem with people do it. But I, I so I have this group of friends. Uh, we have a, a group called the Trolls, and, and we, it's a closed group on Facebook, but we also just have, like, a, a messenger discussion. Basically, we meet, we are good friends we just make fun of fun of each other because we all come from different political backgrounds but we're all pretty lighthearted. so we you know we're always sending people each other political memes and stupid shit but um so every once in a while we'll have a troll get together where we we actually go hang out have cocktails and we're not just bullshitting over the internet we actually get together and have some fun but these guys a couple of these guys you know i, I hosted this thing in my house and they wanted to have like a game guys game night and i'm like cool i'm thinking like okay you know like We'll play poker or monopoly or, or something like that and uh and i know a lot of people are into this so I'm, I'm totally joking when i say this but they brought over these like these crazy ass like demon slayer monster games and shit that like have you know like this you know like dungeon and drag like they were like <laughs> hardcore into this so like we start he starts unfolding this like and it was like he got this like collector's just it's like a wood box so it's like not just like some game board. Like he got like whatever this this Dragon Slayer Crystal game that he got. It's like this is like the premium one. So he brings out this thing. Like the rule book is like this three ring binder. And I'm like, what the fuck, dude? I, I okay. So like he's got all these cards and like I we're starting to play this game and I'm I'm trying to figure. There's so many rules and they all know the rules and I don't know the rules. And he gives me the card and there's like I've got like these different wizards and crystals and shit and i'm just looking at it, it's like what the fuck is going on you know and it's so, like i was trying to get to figure out what's going on and this guy puts a card down and like you start having this battle and i i put my card down and he's like uh my my level four wizard beats your level two oracle and the other guy's like oh but i have the pixie dust card which you know which which counteracts the you know i'm like what the fuck, dude? Like, just count me out. Like, I, I lose. I don't know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> I'll just drink beer and like, You know, and, and, you know, then I'm, I go have a beer in the other room, and I start, you know, just watching them play. And it it sounded like a couple, you know, these little ladies, you know, they're talking back and forth. And, you know, all of a sudden, they're arguing about the rules, and they pull open the rule book. And it's like, uh, section two on page five clearly states that, you know, uh, if you have a troll that's in distress and he uses pixie dust, that like is way higher than your, your, your sword of destruction. So therefore, and I'm like, Oh dude, I, you know, I'm just going to have I, my beer. And I had it. that when I was umpiring uh, baseball last year, this kid balked bad and I was going to say it. 
And then like everybody said it in the rule book. It states if they say it, I can't say it. And I'm just like, yeah, that's awesome. I I can't, I can't. And they're like, well, why didn't you say it? Because you said it. Well, you could still say it. And I pulled out the book. I'm like, right here, asshole. That's That's why I can't. That's awesome. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Yeah. (laughs) yeah, It's just on a whole different level. And then that's what I'm talking about. And so that's why like, you know, the, I used to be a lot more judgmental about you know, things. If, and that's the thing. People are so judgmental about what they don't know about, right, and, or what they're not into. And so, you know, in my mind, I, I, there might have been a time in my life where I, I saw this kind of like, you know, these fucking nerds, like, this is just weird, like, whatever. But I like people who are into their own shit, you know, and they're doing shit that I don't know about. And, like, the older I get, the more I like to – learn and grow and experience people like it's fun for me to learn from other people about shit that I don't know about and so I like to surround myself with people who aren't just like me who are like meatheads who want to go to the gym like I know that crowd I know that information like I want to hang around people that you know are into that stuff sometimes you know like I have those people but I want to hang around you know all kinds of people who are into different things and they can show me something and teach me something about something I don't know and uh, but I just like being around people who have a passion for something you know who aren't just kind of plodding through this average existence and not doing the things they want to do. And so, you know, if, as, as long as you have a job or something, if you want to play magic, the gathering or whatever the hell you want to do, like, uh, you know, that's cool with me. Like, and I think that's cool. And yeah. uh, I just like people, I like seeing people happy and I like seeing people uh, doing what they want to do. And that's, that's again, part of what Jeff is all about is, 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 you know, if people aren't happy with their lives. Like, look, I, I like people to be in shape and healthy, but part of it too is, is it's a confidence thing. It's like, I want people to be happy with who they are. That's what it's really about. It's not necessarily just trying to look good or, or whatever. Um, but there are people that I know and they're, they're few, but there are people that I know that are like happy with who they are. And part of, part of them being big is part of who they are. Like I have this, this buddy, Jeremy, like hilarious dude like big black dude, like hilarious, like funny, like he's well built, like he's an athlete. He's got a lot of muscle on him, but he's, he's a big dude. And, but the, like the way he carries his weight, like it looks good on him. He's like, he's like a big dude, but he's, he's kind of fat, but he like, he's a dude who like, he is confident in who he is. He likes who he is. He's hilarious. Women love him. Like they're, they, they think he's attractive. Like just the way he carries himself, his body, like, even though he's a big dude, like that's a dude who's like, he's happy with who he is. So it's like, you know, if you're happy with who you are, that's truly like, don't change a damn thing. And if you're happy with what you're eating, like don't change a damn thing. Like I just want people to be happy with who they are. And if that requires some change and transformation, then, you know, let's talk about that. Let's do that. But um, you know, for people who are doing what they want to do and they're, and they're happy and, and, and all that, especially emotionally and, 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 and spiritually happy, um, you know, that's what really matters. And that's what this is all about, you know? No, that's a the, an absolutely perfect segue because we do ask one question every time we do an episode. Mm. And I think you actually just defined it. <laughs> so I'm going to ask after the fact, but um, what is your, de- your, your personal uh, definition of success? Mm. I think... Wow, that's a, that's a great question. That's a great question. That's what we get um, told every time we ask it. Because I think that that has changed for me over the years. Um, if I can take a few minutes to answer that question. Absolutely. Do it. I think that a lot of people's idea of success is something that is put into them by society or the people who brought them up or, or the things that they learned. And so a lot of how we see success is based on, you know, our parents or what our parents told us what we learned. I mean, some people's idea of success is, you know, having kids, having a stable job and just you're being, you know, being responsible and paying your bills and being an upright standing citizen. And that's a, that's a successful life, you know, and, um, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like I, I, you know, I, I, there needs to be more people like that in the world who, um, who just go about like 
doing normal shit and, and, and not, not being a problem. And, you know, we have a lot of people who are going the other way in life and then just kind of like destroying themselves and, and, and everything else. But, you know, to get back to the answering the question, like success, I think is, is personally defined. And, um, because I don't like to put anyone into, into a cookie cutter thing of what success is, but for success for me, I think is, um, knowing who you are and, 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 and being truthful with yourself and coming to a point where, um, you're getting better than you were the day before. So I try to tell people to focus on progress, not perfection, because it's something that we'll never actually reach in this lifetime. I mean, I know that for some people, faith plays a role in that. It certainly does for me and then the things they believe, but like we have all this stuff shoved in our face with the media and, and with, you know, magazines and, and all this kind of stuff. Like, like women ascribe to look a certain way when they're looking at these people. It's like some, you know, half the people are these airbrushed drug, drug freaks who are, you know, like bodybuilding and stuff. A lot of the, you know, the pictures are taking, some of them are airbrushed and, you know, they're taking all kinds of drugs and all kinds of things. And these, you get these women who are in bikinis and, and all kinds of, and they're airbrushed pictures. And they're, so there's this standard for people of what, like having a successful body is. And, and um, you, you're not, you know, you're not in good shape unless you have a six pack of abs or, or whatever. Um, but to me, like success again is, is being better than you were the day before and, and, and always, always like moving forward or always trying to move forward. And sometimes we, we take a few steps back, but success again is, is, is not giving up. I, I truly believe that the only time you fail is the last time you try. And we're all going to have these failures, you know, where, where we, um, you know, we kind of might not finish something that we start or whatever that is. And some people might decide to define that as you failed, but as long as you can learn from it and come back, uh, I think again, you know, the only time you fail is the last time you try. When you really throw in the towel and say, I'm done, I give up. I mean, that's when you, I guess, fail. But all the anything short of that is simply um, gathering information and becoming more intelligent about who you are and your mistakes. And as long as you can fall forward, in a sense, um, I think that's success where, you know, again, we all make mistakes, and I certainly do. But, you know, being better than I was the day before is success to me. Um, going after your dreams is success to me. Like, I think that a lot of people have these things that they want and that's part of what Jeff at Transformation is about. And um, some of these other things that I'm a part of that you guys, you know, like the Lion's Den with Sean Whalen and a couple of these other things where it's like the idea of all this is, is for people to live life the way they want to. They, they, they have these dreams and things in their heart that they want, but they get too scared to do it or they're, 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 held back by fear or they're held back by insecurities about themselves. And so they never truly go after what they want or they want, they know what they want. Some people don't know what they want. And part of that's figure, helping them figure it out with Jeff it or with the lion's den or with, you know, all of these other coaches helping people find out what they want. But then when people know what they want, then the next thing is like, okay, how do we get that? Let's just not just talk about like have this bucket list that, that someday or the things that we want or these, these far off dreams or wishes that we, you know, people say, if you could do anything you want, what would you do? And people have an answer for that. Well, they say, if you could go anywhere, where would that be? And they answer that. And it's like, why aren't you doing that? You can do that. You can do that. You can become a firefighter. You just, you have to do the work to do it. Um, but you can do that. Like, don't say that it's a dream. Like you can actually do that people do it every day. And so you're no different than that, than those people. And so success for me and, and how I see it for myself and for other people is, is finding what you want. And once you know what you want, actually pushing all your chips in the middle of the table and, and going after that so that you have a life that you want, you know, this life is a gift. It, it's something that's amazing and beautiful and it can certainly be wasted um, by plotting through an average existence and doing the things that you don't want to do um, because you're too scared to do them. And, and that would be, that would be a shitty life to look back on it is to, to look back and say, have all these things that you wish you could have done that you actually could have done. 
um, but didn't do. And um, all these things like whether it be a career or a, a woman you wanted to ask out or whatever, like, you know, part of it is just trying to live life with no regrets and, and going with that after the things you have after. And part of it is, you know, be willing to take those risks, but that's part of where the education comes in. You start learning from these people who, have, you know, find the people, surround yourself with the people who want, have what you want. Like, you know, if you want to be, a hyper successful like fitness coach find the people who are massively successful at that already who are doing what you want to do and follow them and emulate them and i don't mean like copy you know copy their shit but i mean learn what they're doing and and make your own brand and and do your own thing but figure out what those people are doing and then follow them and start to do the work and that's where the consistency comes in with being successful successful people have figured out what they want and they are daily developing the discipline within themselves to move forward with accomplishing their dreams and goals. And that's really what success comes down to is, is discipline. And um, unfortunately we live in this instant gratification society where people want maximum results with minimal effort. And that's just, that's just not the way it works. You know, if you want to be the best, violinist you have to put in the hours it's not going to happen you know and similarly if you want to be the best power lifter um you've got to do the work or it's just not going to happen so unfortunately we do live in kind of this you know this lazy society but part of part of it is helping people unlearn the unhealthy habits in their life that that hold them back from where they want to be and then the dreams that they have and, and helping them develop new healthy patterns of action that will, that will lead to success. And so that's what success is to me. It's being better than you were the day before and knowing what you want and, and making an effort, a maximal effort within yourself to push all that in the middle of the table and go for it. And I think even if you do in a sense fail, it's kind of like the, you know, that you've heard that quote about the, the man in the, the arena, right? That really long quote you know, talking about like, you know, the, there's the people outside who are going to criticize what you do, but it's, you know, it's the person who, who risks everything to get what they want, who puts themselves in the arena, who jumps into the fight, who takes out the business loan to start the business that they want to start without fully knowing what the future holds. It's those people who, whether they win or lose, they will still have a, a sense of life and a sense of energy that no one else can know because they've been in the arena and they know what it's like to lose and they know what it's like to win. And you can't fully appreciate winning unless you've lost a few times because you know the depths of that depravity and therefore you can appreciate even more um, the wins when they come. And so that's success. That's success to me. Now you brought up a couple of really, really good points. I mean, could you imagine laying on your deathbed with your family around you going, man, I wish I would have done this or I wish I would have done that. You know, yeah. that, that's fucking holy shit. <laughs> well, and, and the worst ones too, is not even about the things that we do, but the people in our lives, like, like, and that's a, that's a big part of like what we, you know, in the, in the lion's den where we talk about power, passion, purpose, and production. That's a, that's a way and you know, there's, there's those key areas in our life and, and passion in that thing would be your relationships. And so a lot of people, you know, they have these relationships, whether it be their wife or their kids or whatever, and they're struggling in this relationship, but they want to make it better, but they don't know how. Well, it's those little things you do every day, those intentional things that you do every day that make things better. And part of what you, what you do and in my thing, like, my thing is the free method that I developed through core four using some of Sean's stuff um, with fitness relationships, education and economics. So in my worksheet, like every day you would put, you do something intentional in those areas. Like for fitness, it's like, okay, I'm going to work out today for an hour or I'm going to do these things. And for relationships, it might be, I'm not married, but if you're married, it's like, I want to have a good relationship with my wife. It's like today, you know, I'm going to write down, or I'm going to, I'm going to send her a, appreciation text. I'm going to tell her that I love her. I'm going to do something that's, that's purposeful. That's going to help move this relationship in the right direction. So, so those little things that we do every day, those consistent things that we do every day that lead to success in those areas of our lives. And I, I, I can't remember, I think it was Colby. Mm -hmm. 
Colby K. He said, yep. he told us, um, your life is going to be a result of your thoughts, feelings, and actions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Yes. Action, I think, is everything. Because you can, like, everybody has thoughts, and we suppress thoughts all the time. And everybody has feelings, but it's a matter of how you act on both of those internalized. For sure. Uh, For sure. And I, I think Sean says something similar, but he's more thinking of it in terms of either a positive or negative about where you're at right now. But, right. you know, most of us are where we're at, whether good or bad, because of the decisions we've made over the last year, whether it be financially or whatever that have led up to where we are. And, um, you know, that's again, where part of this whole thing of, of success comes into is being truthful with yourself. If you do want to make a change and you want to start going down the road of success in any area of your life, it takes being truthful with yourself and other people and saying, this is where I'm at. This is the shit. This is what I need to fix. Um, here, here it is all on a, on a silver platter. Let's, let's get into it. Let's here, but here it is. Here's my life, good or bad. This is what it is. This is the truth. And then once you can do that, you know, if you can, once you can identify what the issues are, and that's the huge, that's the biggest part is most people that are afraid of being judged, whether it's, you know, with their fitness and their overeating or habits or uh, their relationship problems, you know, cheating, porn, wh- whatever the issues are that people don't want to talk about. Those are the things that people need to talk about if they want to get through it and to move forward. And so, uh, you know, really good coaching and really good transformation that, that leads to success is really about, um, getting down to, you know, brass tacks with these things, these, these deeper parts of ourselves. And that's where a lot of coaching is lacking these days, or at least in the fitness world is like everyone focuses on the superficial stuff. And, you know, like I said in that last podcast, you know, a lot of coaching, life coaching or fitness coaching, it's like they're putting people through these, you know, cookie cutter fitness routines and things like that, or they're doing this kind of cookie cutter um, psychological things that, that aren't really being individual with the person. And so if you really want to make a transformation with someone, it means developing a relationship with that person where they trust you and they can share the truths about their lives that it's even hard for them to admit themselves. And then once you can identify the things that hold people back, once, once you know what it is, then you can fix them. But you know, half the problem is people aren't truthful and and they have all this stuff going on in their life. That's causing all this turmoil. Um, And they don't, they're not willing to talk about it. And so a coach can't help them out because they can't identify it. Then they, you know, it's like, if you have a, if you have a sickness, um, you know, you identify what that sickness is and then you take the proper medicine and you take care of it. And similarly with, with emotional things or, or um, fitness problems or, or unhealthy habits or whatever they are, you know, it takes identifying and knowing what they are to be able to deal with them properly and and replace them with new healthy patterns of action that are going to lead to success. I agree. And sometimes it, it's, it's really hard for men, especially, but sometimes you can't go about it alone. You have to find somebody that's going to help support you, coach you. Uh, Dude, you just, you just touched on something that's really huge with stuff that I'm kind of working with right now. So one of the, you know, the motorcycle, I'm part of this motorcycle club and I'm not a veteran myself, but that's really near and dear to my heart because my dad was, and then my grandfather was, and uh, my dad was in the Air Force and flew AC-47 gunships with the Gatling gun sticking out. And my grandfather was in the Air Force. I never met him on my mother's side. He was shot down in, in Korea and, and killed. But the military thing is really important to me. And then uh, this military riding club that I joined, um, you know, one of the things they do is, is uh, you know, help veterans and you know, guys coming back with injuries, but with PTSD and things like that. And one good thing about where the direction of personal development is going is that the stigma of men needing therapy is slowly starting to be chipped away at it in, in a positive way. And that's a good thing because, you know, guys used to not talk about it and they would come back with all this shit and it's kind of like your man deal with it, tough it out. And that is, that is absolutely, you know, and I'm a man's man. Like I, you know, try not to cry and all you know okay fine that's kind of bullshit stuff it's kind of funny but you know that stigma is slowly being lifted and and that's that's a very good thing because there were so many men for so long that 
um, they just needed to talk about their feelings. I mean, if you want to talk about it and they needed to fucking cry and they needed to talk to someone, they needed to deal with their shit. And the only way that they were going to move forward and be successful in any other area of their life, coming back home in their marriages or the perspective of having a new civilian job outside of that, um, or to even be happy within themselves again, is if they were able to be honest and open and talk about that. And that's one good thing that um, is coming out of, uh, you know, like, wounded warrior and all this stuff and, and and is you know there's a lot of bullshit crap out there that's going on but one good thing is that people are recognizing the need for for um mental health uh support and but to have that stigma lifted and to make it acceptable and okay and even more manly to admit it's it's kind of one of those things it's like now now instead of like it's manly to just talk about you know not talk about it and kind of suck it up now it's becoming one of those things where it's like, no, you know, a man tells the truth and tells what's really going inside his heart because that's, that's what's, that's telling the truth is more manly than um, hiding it, you know? And so I think that that, that's a one good thing that I can say that's going on in society and in coaching is that there's this, there's this recognition and this push and this uh, a lot of support coming around the need for um, men to be able to, deal with their emotions and, and the, the bullshit that used to have a stigma of being a pussy or whatever, that's kind of going away because they, they see what's happening. I mean, you have, you have Navy SEALs, you have guys who are the toughest of the tough people coming back and, and committing suicide and, and doing shit that it's like, okay, like something needs to change. And, and that stigma of them not being, shouldn't talking about it and being able to suck it up. Like, no, that's bullshit. And so I, I love that, you know, something like this, you can, have guys on here and, and be able to even talk about like stuff like this, because, um, you know, that that's huge. And, and again, that comes into this whole idea of coaching and success. I mean, part of success in life is, you know, people, again, when we define success, a lot of people, it's a business. They, or they, they think of success as being monetary or business. Like my business has this much and, you know, all this, they put the metrics of the money around it and that's what defines success. But, True success uh, is, I think, the happiness that's in your heart. And, and you know, if you, you know, I know lots of people who have, are entrepreneurs and, and make millions of dollars a year, but they're, they're not happy at all. And they're not happy with themselves. And they, they, they love showing their bank account. They love talking about all this, the shit they're doing. But at the end of the day, they're, they're, their soul is dark, man. And, and um, those, are, you know, those guys, need, those guys need to have a real conversation and be open and honest about, uh, you know, put the, the, fake bullshit of Facebook away that, you know, that, that everything got all their shit together because, you know, they don't, their relationships are falling apart and, and uh, they're just hyper successful people. And they're, they're people who are addicted to their workaholics essentially. And so you get to the root of it. it. It's not, it's not that they love what they do or they're happy with what they do. And there's, there's entrepreneurs that are hyper successful, but they, they're happy and they love what they do and they're helping people and they're doing something every day that they love. And then there's the people who are hyper successful and they got a smile on their face and you think they got all day together, but they're doing all this shit because they're workaholics and they're escaping their, the real core issues. And in that's, in that sense, they're not successful. They're running away from success because success to me is, is being happy with the internal part of who you are and, and where you're going in life. Yeah, yeah, there's a couple points off of that. I mean, um, the statistic right now is 22 veterans or active military combined commit suicide daily. And mm -hmm. that number is absolutely insane. It's insane. Um, we, we also it's had a really good interview with uh, Mr. Michael Dalbo who is now blind he's a veteran he faced homelessness he's finally in a room that he's renting and stuff like that but now he's kind of he's on the verge of, of going back to being homeless he's dealing with the va and social security and all that stuff and there's just not the right support system for veterans and his ultimate goal is absolutely tremendous he wants to build uh, communities like tiny houses basically he wants to buy like mm -hmm. and put a fuck ton of tiny houses in there and house veterans yeah and that would be incredible if that's something that he can pull off but he's got to get him his own stuff figured out first 
So um, I completely agree. I mean, there's there's so many people out there that just don't the the supports out there, but they just can't connect. I guess is yeah. what I was kind of going for. Uh, and that, that's a, another thing too when we talk about all this helping other people and things. A lot of the people who want to help the best, the people who help the most are the people who have been through have been through before and, and they understand what's going on. It's like, it's like a drug addict who an ex drug addict who helps another drug addict. Like the only person who can truly speak into that person's life is a person who's been down that road before, because you know, for someone like me, who's never been an alcoholic um, for me to think that I can identify with someone and I can tell them anything about their life or that they need to change or anything else. And I don't understand that. That's, that's bullshit. Uh, they shouldn't listen to me and they, they, uh, I wouldn't expect them to want to hear it from me, but if someone else, you know, who's been down that road can talk to you and say, man, I, I lost my family. I lost everything because of these decisions I made. And, you know, here's what I went through. And I, I've been to the depths of that. And like that person can speak into that person's life. And so it's important to have other bets, um, who have been through that and can understand what's going on and under can identify with, like, I support all that stuff. Like we do charitable stuff and, and all kinds of stuff, but I don't know what that's like. Like, I don't know what that's like to, um, you know, go over there and have to watch my best friend's face get blown off right next to me. And, and, uh, um, you know, come back to people, uh, hating what you do and hating you being a part of the military and voting for Donald Trump and all, all this stuff going on in your mind. And like, um, you know, you come back, you know, you have this year deployment you come home and like your wife and kids and family and friends kind of have their own new routine because you've been gone so long and you come back from this war zone and try to reacclimate into life. And, and there's stress, there's uh, relationship stress coming back right away and all, you know, all this shit. And um, I don't know what that's like. And, it takes someone else, you know, who's been through that, who's dealt with it to be able to speak in that. And so there's a lot of good stuff happening in, in that, but it's still not enough. Like you said, there's, there's too many guys, too many men and women, um, you know, who are taking their own lives and it's, it's not necessary. And, um, you know, I, I had something recent and you know, a guy that I knew who was actually a pastor uh, who had been in the military and he openly struggled with PTSD um, but when you have a guy who's, you know, still his faith is really strong and all this stuff and he, you know, he just had a moment of just pure weakness, I'm sure, or terror or whatever he had to deal with. And, you know, he ended up taking his own life in, in a weak moment. But it's um, it's just one of those things like even someone who, who is that well supported is still something is going on there. It just shows you that, you know, there's a real need still out there for, for mental health stuff, just both medication and in therapy. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a real problem. Even my best friend who just came back is he's doing fine, but you know, he's, you know, he's struggling with a little, with kind of reacclimating a little bit and he's, he's doing it right. But you know, he's a really tough guy and to see him, you know, kind of struggling a little bit, you know, I, I can see it, you know, I can see it. And to have that happen to someone who's as strong as him mentally and spiritually, um, I can see how easily it could happen to someone else who isn't as strong and then gets thrown into that without any kind of mental support system or whatever. There's a lot of military people who go into the military simply because they don't have family and they don't have options. And so they're going into that um, with no support system, really. And then they go over the war zone and, and, and get into something they couldn't have imagined. And they come back just with nothing. Um, and that's... Uh, that's part of what all this is about is, you know, with the stuff we're doing, the motorcycle club and, and whatever is to bring people around those people and, and create a community for them where they can talk about their issues and, and learn and grow and heal. And that's what it's all about is community. And especially like what you guys are doing here, this podcast, you know, creating brotherhood, creating connections, making a network of people. Um, and that's one good thing is I have a love hate relationship with social media. You know, it, it can be the worst thing in the world and can be an amazing thing. And with all the bad shit, one of the good things about social media is that it's done a ton to help veterans connect. It's done a ton to help um, get, uh, fundraising going and things like that. And so um, social media for me has really become more of a tool than, than a, a, you know, like a, 
the silly little fun thing that I do. It's, it has a purpose. And if I think if you use it right, it can be a very powerful thing. And um, so even what we're doing here today, um, you know, uh, some of the other podcast stuff, you're able to get eyes on, on a conversation that would none, nonetheless have never been able to unless it was something platform like this. So I think all this stuff is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I used to do that. I mean, just shared the memes and the dumbass posts and kind of, I don't know, recently I just crossed like a thousand friends or whatever on social media. Um, Pat Hilton actually told Brad to knock his political shit off and he still does it. So I'm trying to transition Brad a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> music Pat. Yeah. Pat Hilton. Pat Hilton. He's hilarious. Dude. I fucking love Pat. Um, but yeah, we, by the time this episode comes out, uh, there was an episode that we recorded with one of our friends that we actually grew up with. He's in Korea right now, active military. And that was like one of the things I hyper-focused on with him was what the hell are you going to do when you get out? Oh, totally. you come back to the yeah. States. What are you going to do? You know, like, how are you going to keep focused? How are you going to make money? How, like, what, what's your plan? Sure. And it's interesting you said, you said that because a lot of having <clears throat> those guys are so used to structure in the, in the, in the military Right. They always have a plan. They always have structure. They always have something going on where it's like their day is very regimented. Yes. Everything's kind of put in front of them. And so when guys get out, sometimes, like you said, they don't know what the hell to do with themselves because they always had a plan. They always had a marching order. They always had some structure. And now they don't. And a lot of people struggle with that big time because they don't know how to create structure for themselves because it's always been given to them and a lot of guys who get out of the military they want to start their own business they may have good work ethic but the, the structure to things was given to them and so to create structure is a whole different thing it's one thing to be able to have structure and follow it that's a great skill too but it's another thing to be able to create structure for yourself and that's a key thing in becoming a successful entrepreneur that a lot of people don't understand and I'm still learning myself is, you know, you have to have the self-discipline to get up every morning and do the things that you need to do to make a paycheck because, you know, it's easy enough to go on autopilot and go to the construction job I used to, or, you know, to, to put your military uniform on and then go to PT f for the day and do whatever. And it's just kind of autopilot, you know, um, and then you get a paycheck. But, uh, you know, when you have to create structure for yourself, um, it's a, it's a whole different ball game. And, and like you said, a lot of guys coming back, uh, they struggle with that, but they also struggle with, with brotherhood and community. Like, you know, over there, a lot of them are like special forces guys. I learned buddy Rick, you know, they're in a tight unit of dudes, you know, 12 dudes, six dudes, 12 dudes that are living together. They're talking about everything. They become best friends. Um, and then they get back and they kind of go back to their families and, and the, they love their family, but that, that, community just isn't the same the camaraderie and those things and so a lot of guys need to still keep that part of their life alive in some way and, and that's where honestly that's where you know the, when you talk about uh, motorcycles a big part of my life but that's how a lot of the you know i'm, I'm in a motorcycle uh mc or a, you know a motorcycle club and how a lot of these motorcycle clubs started you know um was after the war these guys not we're trying to come back and reacclimate in society and real, you know, they started these clubs and started hanging out together to keep the brotherhood alive and to be able to deal with the problems that they had and get out on a motorcycle and get away from the bullshit and go on these things and hang out together. And, um, that's where a lot of these communities uh, were born out of was the necessity for, for guys to be able to deal with their shit. And, and, um, you know, like how many, you know, you see a VFW in town and you go down there and it's just, it's a bunch of old guys having a beer talking about their glory days and, and that's therapy for them. And that's good that they can get together and do that and talk about that shit. Um, I love seeing that kind of shit, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, it, I didn't even think about the VFW until you said it. And I was like, you know, the town I just left had one oh, yeah. and very shit. It was like, it was just full of old guys that were vets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, one of the coolest things I ever saw was uh, I went with my dad. You know, they had the, the military or the Vietnam Memorial Wall, obviously, in Washington, D.C. 
that's a permanent permanent structure there. But they have the, what's called the traveling wall, and it's literally um, a slightly scaled down version of the Vietnam Memorial. Right. But it's it's portable. I think it's either a metal wall, but it, it looks like the rock wall. Anyway, they travel around with it to these different places, and they set up basically a, a, a weekend festival. You know, there's food and music and and kind of uh, military themed stuff and they got you know they got all kinds of stuff going on it's more of a mo- military memorial thing but you know some of these guys like i went to one you know a few years back with my dad before he passed away and we'd gone on this rv trip so we took the rv up there and we hung out at this vietnam memorial like like festival i guess you could call it and we hung out for the weekend and i felt like i was going back into the 60s it was like you had all these old dudes you know were you know, late 50s, 60s, 70 years old, they're all riding motorcycles, you know, they got, they got kind of ponytail going on, they got their fatigue still on, and it's like, time stopped for them, it's like, they got out of the military, and like, that was the, their defining moment in life, that was, that was, became a, such a part of who they are, and that brotherhood that they created there in Vietnam, and, and, and seeing, going through that shit together, that how they were able to survive is to just kind of keep living that to some degree and you know and, right. and so it was interesting to see that because i'd never really experienced that up close you know i'd seen that kind of thing in movies and things but it was very real and um it was it was an interesting study in, in human psychology even though know, i was a younger guy when i saw it i could recognize that you know and in, in, in those guys and that need for that need for recognition that need to feel good about what they did um and the need to be around other brothers who'd been through that what they'd been through and to be able to talk about it and and to some degree be proud of it you know that that's that's such their military career was such a big part of who they are that they love talking about it because it's you know they have a lot of accomplishments there and they, they that's that's part of who they are and so i think there's a healthy amount of, of pride in that that you know these guys get to talk about and and, and kind of relive the glory days you know and so I, I i love talking and i'm not in the military myself but i love those conversations because it's uh it's really cool to hear an old guy talk about himself as a young man and the things that he did and all the things he was proud of and, and again that you know those are the kinds of people that inspire me and uh, make me want to be a better man as you hear these stories from these old guys who they did life right. They have a successful life. They're looking back on the, you know, they did, the military careers, all these funny stories, all the jokes, all the good friends they had. And you're like, that sounds like a pretty good life to me. And and, and, and that's cool. And, and that's again, why this podcasts and, and things like we're doing here is, is sharing stories. I mean, you never know when what you have to say or sharing your story is going to resonate with someone else and help them, uh, move forward in, in a way in their life or make a transformation or to see things from a new perspective. And so I always encourage people to, to share themselves and share their story. And even though they may be, might feel vulnerable doing that, um, you really can add some value to people. It's like, you know, I'd gone through a depression and things before, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not something I like talking about, at least initially, but when I realized that I could help other people who had been down that road before, um, and was able to add value. It, it helped me talk and help with my own mental healing with all that. Um, and so again, like we talked about, like men being able to sh- talk about their feelings and all these types of stuff, it might sound kind of gay or whatever on the surface, but truthfully, like, I think it's good that that stigma is being lifted and that men can come together just like we are in this podcast and have a real open conversation about life and about whatever and not feel like you're a pussy talking about your feelings or whatever and yeah motherfucker i cry i don't give a shit i'll tell you that when my emotions get high and there's something like you talk people start talking about my dad and his military career and how much i i cared about him loved him and how much he was a good friend like i'll start to cry like a baby but you know i don't give a shit anymore like i used to feel like i'm not supposed to cry or whatever like yeah, I don't give a shit. And I think that part of part of being happy in life too is 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 um, you know developing you know that book. It's like the subtle art of of not giving a fuck, right? Type of a thing. Where and obviously you know there's the people who are so angry at life they 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 don't give a fuck. That's not the kind of not giving a fuck I'm talking about. But like when you don't truly don't give a fuck in a healthy way anymore. You stop caring what other people think of think about you or your story or whatever and you become comfortable with who you are 
and with all the good and the bad and, and all that, and you're able to start moving down this road of self-improvement, but accepting who you are in your past and who you are now and, and aspiring to the person you're going to be, when you stop giving a fuck, I think that's when life really starts, you know. You, know, you mentioned uh, perspective, and I don't know if you saw this uh, video that we posted when we were talking to Mr. Dalbo, um, same gentleman I mentioned before, and I, I had told him that I wasn't military, and that was kind of one of my biggest regrets in life, and he said, why would that be a regret? I said, because I wish I would have joined. I was going to, my ex talked me out of it. Three months later, found out she was pregnant, that whole thing. Um, and he said, you know what? You gave me a job. So thank mm -hmm. you for your service by being a good citizen and not a piece of shit paying your taxes. I appreciate everything you did. And I was like, sure. fuck. <laughs> yeah. And see, that's, that's a, that's a good perspective too. Like, again, when we talk about success, like so many people have these, and that's, that's again, a problem with a lot of coaching and a lot of what has been going on the internet. If, you know, for a while there, I, it's kind of starting to, the market's kind of becoming oversaturated. So there's a little slowly becoming less of it, especially with how the dynamics of how Facebook work is changed, works is changing. Um, but, you know, the message to a lot of people, you know, like I like Gary Vee and stuff like that, you know, aspects of what he says, but there's a lot of stuff out there that it's like these hyper successful people who are doing all this shit and their, their mind is working on a different level and all this stuff. And some people just aren't like that. They're not built that way. They don't, they don't take joy in all. And there's some people it's like, if you're not maximizing every aspect of your life, like you are not successful. Like we need a 10 X this. I'm, I'm not talking about Grant Cardone in, in the sense of like him pushing that, but there are people who have that mentality where it's like, you need to be maximizing your relationships, maximizing your fitness, maximizing this max. And so you have this thing. It's like, you're not successful unless you're like maximizing everything. And you've got a coach for this and a coach for that. And you're, you're like, and somewhere in that you can get so caught up in that, that you, you, you miss like, life like you miss yeah. like what's happening in front of you you miss you it's like it's like you know you need to sometimes just slow down and smell the proverbial rose it's like you know slow down take a break like and so many people are so hyper focused on being successful by what they think the world's definition of success is that they they like aren't fully present in the moment like you're with them, but they're not really there. They're thinking about numbers. They're thinking about the next like coaching call. They're thinking about this. And it's like, I can sit here with you guys and be fully present in this conversation because yeah, do I have shit going on my mind? Yeah. But I'm not so, I'm not so out there with my own like business development that I can't like turn it off for a few minutes and have a conversation with you guys. That's meaningful, but there's some people who can't. And I think that's when you're having a, you're, you're, you're missing the point with success. And there's a lot of people who are like that. You know, they're not fully present. You know, you, you, they might be hanging out with you. You know, they might be in the kid, the living room with their kids because they work from home, but they're not there. You know, the kids are playing, asking questions and they're on their cell phone. Their mind is completely gone and they're, they're missing their kids grow up and they're right in front of them. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And that's something that I've been personally working on. I, I read it, it, and it, was, it was like, you can, you can be present, but you're not present. Yeah. And yeah. it's a, it was like, it was, it was this big checklist of, of shit that like, are you on your phone? Are you watching the TV or are you engaging with your kids? Or um, does your wife put the kids to bed every night? I'm like, fuck, my wife puts my kids both to bed every night while I sit in the chair. So yeah. like, I fucking suck. What like you know? So we gotta we gotta do something here. Uh, well, and so uh, it's, it's little things like that that will improve your daily life, your relationships, hundred uh, percent. You know everything. And there's there's a happy medium there. It's it's it comes down to, you know, we have to prioritize things, and and, and I that's a difficult thing to do because sometimes you get in the zone on something, and you want you, you get in this one track mind about whatever, and you can lose yourself in that or lose your presence in that. And, but you have to be intentional because I, 
you know, obviously as an entrepreneur, you have to put in a certain amount of hyper-focused time to what you're doing um, to make that, that enterprise successful. Like you have to put in the time and work and the effort. But what it really comes down to is, is developing the, the discipline or, or whatever you want to call it to be able to um, compartmentalize those things in your life. So you have the time that you put into work and uh, you, and that's the most, the healthiest people do that. They structure their day in such a way that you know, they have their morning routine and then they, they have the time, even if they work from home, that they're working business hours, like, in their mind, they say, okay, I'm working from this time to this time. I'm dedicating maximum effort during these time periods. But after that, I'm going to shut that off. And I'm going to turn my phone off and I'm going to go sit on the couch with my wife and talk about her day and I'm going to wrestle with my kids a little bit. And, um, you know, that, that needs to be done too, uh, to, some, to some degree to, to make those other areas of your, your life work. And a lot of people can't do that, but that's, that's essential is to be able to be hyper focused when you have to be, but be able to shut that off, you know. Completely agree. Um <laughs> we only booked an hour with you, but we're at two now. So awesome. <laughs> the time flies when you're having a good conversation. <laughs> um I'm gonna shut up and and let Brad take the final question if he has any. Um I don't think so at this moment. <laughs> yeah, right on. Well this is this is cool. I mean these are the best these are the best types of podcasts, you know, sometimes where there is no structure. I mean, I, I like having structure, but when you, you know, sometimes it's like if you're giving a speech, I remember doing a, a wedding speech one time and like sometimes when you, you write all the words down and you're trying to make it perfect and you end up, you end up writing stuff down and you're trying to be so perfect with it that you end up trying to, remember what you're writing and it becomes less organic and less natural because you're, you're have this script that you're trying to remember. And I remember I had this perfect script and all this stuff. And I, I, right at the last minute, I just, I literally crumbled right over the ball and I threw it and I just, I just walked up there and I just went with what I felt, you know, and, and I had this, this long speech planned out. I had memorized it and I was trying to recall some of the things so I didn't screw it up. And I just thought that from like, you know what, fuck this shit, dude. I'm just going to go up there and talk, you know? And it turned out really good. And I, actually, the first thing I did was <laughs> before I even started my speech, I stood up and I grabbed the microphone and I said, you know, I've been told that a, a proper best man speech should, should last about as long as you think it'll take the groom to make love on his wedding night. So I'm like, <laughs> So, so I guess ten seconds. I guess that's it. And I, <laughs> I handed the mic back and I sat down and then I of course got back up and, and finished the speech and I was, you know, I, it was just all, you know, it was organic and natural and I I got everyone laughing, got everyone involved. And and sometimes, you know, like with these podcasts, you know, I've been a part of them where there was too much structure and you're trying to answer questions in a specific way or you're trying to create a vibe for the whole thing and, and it becomes uh it becomes kind of unreal and un inorganic and uh, something like this is, is really good where people can just get on it and talk and let the conversation go where it naturally wants to go. And because that's real life, that's how people interact. That's how people communicate. That's how people talk, you know? And, and uh, I think it's those, those conversational uh, podcasts that I think hit home uh, with a lot of people more so than uh, some of the other ones. So I think you guys are doing something really cool here. I appreciate it very much. Was and that was that. that was absolutely one of our number one goals is to just show people that entrepreneurs, CEOs, musicians, like all these big name people, really because like everybody we talk to is bigger than us, but they're just people. You know, it's like you, you walk through the airport and you run into Kanye West. You're not going to be like, oh my god, ah. Yeah, I up you, and introduce myself, shake his hand, take a picture, and be like, "Cool." Dude, take, speaking of that, did you, you know? see that, did you see that post I did with Kanye West? No. Oh, dude, you gotta go. I'll, I'll send it to you when I'm done. This is that's a All whole right. other story. So I I thought maybe you'd seen that. So I've got a post about it. You know, I just said the first name that came to my face. That's hilarious. <laughs> you said that. Dude, that is so hilarious. You said that because this is a true story. Last year, I was on a motorcycle ride. Uh, 
And Colby, if he watches this, he'll laugh his ass off because I make fun of him for it every single time. So I'll make him watch it, or at least we'll cut it. Yeah, tag him in that. Uh, So we'd gone on this motorcycle trip. uh, My good friend Steve Fielding and Colby was supposed to go on this motorcycle trip with us. Um, So we were going, you know, over through Montana. uh, No, we we went through Colorado and um, a couple other places, and we had a great trip. But Colby was supposed to go. Couldn't go at the last minute, so I ended up, and uh, Sean Whalen was supposed to go, uh, a couple of the guys, and it all got fucked up, and it ended up being just Steve and I. You know, great trip, by the way, even though it was just him and I, we had a fucking blast, awesome. The weather was great, I mean, it was just one of those ep- epic fucking rides. Anyway, so we're going through, uh, we're going through, um, uh, what do we call that, or uh, Jackson Hole, we're, we're going through Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And we rent this log cabin thing for the night. Steve's pretty tired. So he goes to bed and they have a thing called million dollar cowboy bar there. I always wanted to check it out. Uh, I've heard about it. It's kind of one of those like destination bars. It's just a cool place. So Steve goes to sleep. I kind of take a shower and head into town. I'm going to grab a beer and I see all these people outside, but we're in like Jackson Hole, Wyoming in a weird time of year. It's like we're on the middle of nowhere, basically. And there's all these people in this bar. And so like I go up and grab a uh, beer and I'm kind of looking around and there's like all these people like crowded over in the corner and, and I'm, I'm like what the hell's going on so the bartender's like oh yeah that's that's Kanye West that's Kanye West over in the corner I'm like what the hell is he doing in Jackson Hole Wyoming <laughs> he's like he's like well he rented a place out here like I, 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 don't, I think he owns it now but he's like he wanted to get away and like do some recording and just be in a different like environment you know so he had this farm and he's like well yeah there had a studio and all this shit so he's just at this million dollar cowboy bar in town having drinks um and if you go back to that post i'll tag you guys in it you can see all the pictures i took with him and the people who were there so uh i'm thinking okay and at the time like i wasn't a big Kanye west fan to be honest with you like i thought he was kind of a jackass like the stuff he said on tv i'm like this guy's an asshole nut job whatever and uh so I was kind of judging a book guy's trouble. Like, I have no idea what his life is like. And to be, you know, he recently admitted that he had struggled with some mental illness and things that could affect the way that he acted at times. So like, you got to give the guy some grace once you get to know those things. But anyway, uh, so I'm sitting at the bar and I'm like, oh, Kanye West, you're okay. And then all of a sudden I just started thinking like, you know what, fuck it. I want to meet this guy, right? Like, so I kind of look over there and I can tell he's got this big ass bodyguard to stand there. He's like kind of keeping people away. And, but he's kind of like letting some of the groupie chicks who are hanging out there, like come say hi. And like, he's, he's flirting with them too. And after about an hour, yeah, well, I, I was sitting down and I was kind of, after about an hour, people kind of started to do their own thing again. And the, you know, the, the excitement of him being there kind of dwindled a little bit. He's at the table and his bouncer starts talking to some chick. So she's kind of, he's kind of turned the other way. And I saw this opportunity for me to just walk right up to him. And so that's where sometimes taking risks, I'm walking up there and he was either going to tell me to fuck off or, you know, he'll be cool. And I didn't care. Like, I didn't care. I'm like, well, whatever. You know, he's just a human being. If he, I've heard fuck you before, like yeah. I can hear fuck you from Kanye West. I don't care. I'll tell him to fuck off right back and go back to having my beer, whatever. So I walk up and uh, his bodyguards the other way. And I'm like, Hey man, like, I know you're probably dealing with a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of shit right now and people coming up to you is like, uh, you know, I'm kind of a fan. I just want to say hi and see if I can get a picture with you. I know my boys will think it's pretty cool. Uh, one of my boys, Colby, who used to be a DJ, you know, like he would think it was cool because he couldn't be here. So, and he's like, he's like, yeah, my man, that's cool. So he stands up and you can tell he's not annoyed with me, but he's just kind of annoyed at the crowd. And so he's taking a picture and he doesn't really have a smile on his face. He's got his arm up on me. And I was like, how can I make this motherfucker laugh? Right. And did you ever hear that? Did you ever see that thing on TV that he was doing some kind of like he was doing this fundraiser with uh, Mike Myers on for Hurricane Katrina and, and on live TV, Mike Myers is talking and he's talking about how George Bush is sending funding down there and stuff like that. And he, all of a sudden, Kanye West grabs the mic and he goes, George Bush hates black people. And like, so it's kind of a big deal because it's one of his moments and like, you could just see Mike Myers is like, what, you know, like they're on this live, like fundraising thing. And he just says that out of nowhere. And so like that became this big, so he apparently doesn't like George Bush. And so jokingly, I'm like, all right, so we're taking this picture. I'm like, I'm like, Hey man, I got your, if anything goes down in here, I got your back. He's like, I used to run security for your, your, your buddy, George Bush. 
and he kind of looks at me and he realizes that I remembered like what he said on TV and he just started, <laughs> he started laughing, man. He's like, he's like, man, that is some of the stupidest shit I ever said. He's like, I shouldn't have said that. He's like, I took a lot of shit for that. That's fucking funny shit, dude. He's like, he's like, dude, you know what? Have a drink. He's like, I'll buy, he's like, have a drink of this. Like, now I'm like, holy shit. All right. So this is like, I didn't know who they were at the time because like, you know, old school rap maybe is my thing, but I don't know who's who like in the rap world now. You know, a couple yeah. of people on this, but that's that's not my thing. So there's like young Jeezy, like Yachty, something. There's like a couple other dudes there that like when I show people the picture, they're like, Oh, do you know who that is? I'm like, No, I don't know. Of course I knew who Kanye was. So we're all sitting there having drinks. And uh like he's talking to someone else and then he I was wearing my uh my leather riding vest and had the second amendment patch on there. So he's like, you know, where are you from? We're talking, making bullshit small talk and all of a sudden he goes he goes he sees my second amendment patch he goes he goes are you strapped right now and i'm like i'm like yeah well don't tell anyone but hell yeah i am he goes, he goes all right cool he's the worst kind of sitting there and then at that point i'm like dude i gotta call colby and like just let him like whatever so i i facetime colby and he doesn't answer the phone it's kind of like later in the night so I FaceTime him, he hangs up, and I just see him text me. He's like, just getting up to pee, I'm asleep. I'm like, dude, you might want to answer this call. He obviously didn't see that, went back to bed. So Kanye, he's got, he goes, he goes, you trying to get hold of someone? I'm like, oh, yeah, my buddy. He's my buddy Colby. He's the DJ guy I was telling you about. Oh, he used to be a DJ. He couldn't be here. He's like a huge fan of yours. He's like, give me your phone. So he takes my phone and hits FaceTime again. So he's, Kanye West has my phone, is calling Colby, and he doesn't pick up the phone. So he's like, oh, it looks like your boy's not picking up. Gives me my phone back. So I'm like, I'm like, Colby, you just missed a FaceTime call from Kanye West. <laughs> so like, a couple minutes go by and like, I just, Colby texts back. He's like, yeah, yeah, ha ha, dude, I'll talk to you in the morning. So then he shut, you know, he, his little like thing goes blank. So he obviously shut his phone off. So I'm like, oh my God. Well, at that point, like. Uh, some other guy came over and he's like hey Kanye your ride's outside so he's like they get up and he's like hey man you want to you want to help walk me outside he's like you got your strap on right and I'm like yeah he's like all right yeah just walk out with me and my boy so like literally I became his temporary bodyguard like we push a few people out of the way I'm like kind of just standing by him and like I just walk him out to this SUV you know and we kind of like part the seas of people there and he's got this huge dude next to him who's like six three you know this huge black dude who looks like yeah just massive dude and then uh, some other guy behind him. And then, uh, yeah, and then me. So we walk out of this SUV and he goes, yeah, hey, we're having a little after party at my place. He's like, you're welcome to call me over there. I'm going to just play some of my tracks. We're going to have a bonfire and shit. I'm like, dude, you got to be fucking kidding me. So there's actually a post I'll tag you in. It's like a video of me at the bonfire there. Like, it's, it was insane. This is an insane thing. And so then, like, I show these pic. I posted these pictures online. And then Colby wakes up and sees this. And he's like, what? <laughs> you kidding me dude i'm like dude yeah call it he was calling you man and like so to this day like would you if you see some of our comments going back and forth every once in a while where connie west will come up colby's like he'll say things like and remember to answer your fucking phone no matter what and uh, but yeah yeah no he, he thought i was totally kidding and i was i was totally serious so that's my connie west story i'm gonna give him the for that one Hell yeah. <laughs> That's your damn phone, Colby. Yeah, right. No, for sure. Well, cool. I appreciate you giving us the time of day and of course, man. Uh, spending twice as much time as we had planned with you. Um, yeah, two hours now. <laughs> it's It's been really fun. And I think that, uh, that uh, my suspicion was right that you're fucking awesome. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Well, you guys too, man. Just just uh just by the shit you got going in the background of your wall i can tell you're an awesome dude and i can't quite see what you got going on in the background there but you have an awesome beard both of you do so yeah, you're obviously that's cool dude right you have on that that's my that's ammo right. that's, that's, that's his right. box of ammo the rest belongs to his wife yeah <laughs> there you my wife's like you can have one of those i'm like well i'm putting ammo on that th sucker that's right you got to have your own cubby hole there for your mansion at least <laughs> yeah. just one right hell yeah well, cool, guys. I mean, anytime, man. I'd love to do this again. And then, uh, you know, I'll be doing my own thing. So I'd love to maybe have you guys on as, as a guest on that sometime. We can we can bullshit again. But uh, one of the things we might be doing with uh, uh, Mike Miller and Jeff Gutowski and Jeff Watson is uh, doing kind of a, a 
you know, late night uh, fireside whiskey discussion. We just, you know, get together and smoke some scars and basically we're doing talking right here and just bullshit about life and business and everything. So I'd be uh, cool. love to bring you guys in on that at some point. Yeah, it'd be awesome. I know all three of them. So. All right. Yeah. They're, they're, they're funny fuckers. Those guys. <laughs> <laughs>